available first let us see under for under what conditions you would want to do it okay. you will find that increasingly many of the things that you want to do can be done very simply and easily in python and so it's only for certain specific reasons you may want to uh, try and extend python to these other compiled languages uh, the main reason i think which is which has always been true of python and is still true to some extent is speed so if you are writing a very very large code which uh, uh, it needs to be highly optimized you may be running for a long time okay suppose you have a code which runs for 6 months and then uh, you can do something and make it run at twice the speed you actually save a large amount of uh, time and but money okay so so for large codes definitely speed is of quite important but if a code is takes 2 seconds to run uh, in c and it takes 4 seconds to run in for the, in python then that is not that much of an overhead you don't really get so you have to look at your requirement and see whether the additional speed that you will get from c c++ or program is worth the extra effort that you will put in uh, in order to uh, write code in that language oh. the second reason might be uh, to leverage existing libraries that have not ex uh, already been wrapped so as we have seen throughout this course is that many many commonly used uh, fortran uh, libraries and also the, to a large extent c and c++ libraries are now wrapped what that means is somebody else has taken the effort of making these libraries accessible from within your python program so you would actually call the same function that you would call in fortran uh, or in c uh, from within the python program and it will actually use uh, the existing Fortran library as the backend. So you will still need to install the Fortran library on C library, but that will be directly used from within a Python program software. Yeah. Uh, so for you as a user, it might appear uh, that the existing library is already wrapped, so you don't really even care or even know that sometimes that this is a Fortran function you are calling from within uh, your uh, Python program. The third reason might be if you are building an instrument and you want Python programs to actually access devices. And these will have some absolute memory addresses, and this is traditionally been done in C. Okay, for many decades now, uh, you uh, actually access devices uh, from within uh, uh, the C program. So C became very popular because it allows you that low-level access to devices. What has what is being done now, uh, and quite successfully, is for example for the Cat Seven telescope that the South Africans have built. They have built a top-level Python library that allows access to devices okay so you can actually have a python command which goes to the servo motor okay so you can give an instruction to the servo motor to do something okay traditionally this would be done in c and in practice even today it's really done in c but what they have done is they have provided a high level python function which allows you to directly do this so python calls some some c function the C function drives, gives the instruction to the motor and then uh, comes back in. So the entire monitoring and control system of the CAT7 system and uh, now they feel eventually Meerkat also will be based on this idea. So the engineer or the astronomer will be issuing commands from within the Python console but internally behind the thing you are actually handling real hardware devices. Although Python cannot talk to real hardware devices directly Indirectly, you can use uh, C functions as intermediary to talk to Python. However, if none of these reasons apply, then you should happily code in Python. There is no reason, there is nothing missing from Python now that would require you to actually go to Fortran or to C or C++ in order to write your code. So before you try to do any extension work, okay, uh, you have to decide on an approach. That approach depends on the answers to a number of questions. Let's go through some of them here. So suppose you have the, some compiled language code 
if it is small enough to recode in Python. So suppose you wanted some numerical receipts code, okay, which uh, is there in C or Fortran. You have it there, and uh, it may in turn depend on three or four other subroutines. You can just easily take all of them and recode them in Python. And there are various projects already available. So even this uh, has already been done to a large extent in SciPy. So you don't even have to do this. But suppose there are one or two specialized functions which have not been converted, you can do those. If the code is some large library, okay, uh, for example, the LAPAC uh, linear algebra package, for example, see if it has already been wrapped in Python. So it turns out that LAPAC is already wrapped in Python. So all the work has already been done for you. You don't need to do anything. You just have to call the LAPAC uh, subroutines just as you would call them from within a Fortran program. Okay. Now if the code that you have uh, is already written, suppose you have some large code in Octave or IDL or MATLAB or Mathematica, etc. And uh, you happen to have some license or unlicensed copy of the software, it will just be easier for you to use the interfaces to these languages. So you, you run your uh, thing, use the Python modules that we have for interfacing between Python and these respective packages and just call them, the packages, and make a function call and it will go there. It will run at the native speed of Mathematica or the native speed of uh, IDL and so on and it will give the output back to you. Then you can continue processing the file. So this is also an option. This is true particularly of uh, uh, IDL and Mathematica where uh, in sci many scientists have written codes over the years. They don't want to port that whole thing uh, over to Python. Uh, it's also true if you have written lots of engineering type codes where MATLAB is more popular, the same thing might also be. <coughs> SciPy has not included most of these things. It's an incomplete set. Out of it is an incomplete set, definitely, because things like uh, Mathematica and IDL have uh, really have many many features which are not yet been uh, included in SciPy. So you will easily find functions which uh, are not available uh, in SciPy. Although that is changing, but that may take some time to change. You could also do something like this. I mean, suppose it's some simple ideal function, okay? You could easily, but people will say, no, no, it's not a simple ideal function. It's an entire uh, X-ray astronomy package or a solar uh, astronomy package is entirely written in ideal. There are thousands of lines of code. Then what do we do, okay? So for such things, it is still better to just call ideal from within your Python program, do your processing there and uh, so what we are going to cover today is how to exchange arrays between Python and Fortran or Python and C, etc. without writing anything to disk, okay? So uh, the reason why we do that, of course, is that disk I.O. is slow and uh, in memory transfer, it's basically just you're passing an address to a memory location, which is extremely fast. So, but sometimes it may just be simpler to use disk files for interchanging data. I'll give you an example. Suppose you are running some big simulation in Fortran. That simulation runs on a supercomputer uh, for six months, okay? And then it gives you some output file, which you then want to analyze. There is no reason to try and convert that big simulation into Python and so on, okay? You let it run, let it generate the output, and then you do, do the analysis on the output from within Python. Okay, and there are two lots of tools to read almost any format, binary, ASCII, etc. Okay, so in that case, exchanging disk files is a more efficient way of doing it. So what I'm trying to highlight here is for every particular problem, you have to ask yourself these questions and then choose the path of least resistance. Okay, but then suppose you decide there's some library which only you use, nobody has wrapped it else in Python and you want that to access that library in Python, then it is always more efficient to wrap many, many subroutines together instead of trying to do it one at a time. Try to wrap the whole library like people did with LabPack. And you can often collaborate on this and there are a number of mailing lists where you can ask the question. There might be somebody else who is already starting to do that uh, particular problem. And in the age of social media, it's not very hard to find the collaborator 
who will uh, work with you and help you with this job. Okay. But suppose most of these things don't apply and you actually want to extend Python. So the most trivial kind of extension is something called NumPy C extensions. So I told you that NumPy has about 400 functions already incorporated. But maybe it doesn't have the 401 function that you want. Okay. So instead of complaining that no, it's not there, what do I do, I can't use NumPy, etc. You can actually use something called uh, NumPy C extensions, which is basically a simple way of writing that function. So as a trivial example, suppose somebody wrote the function of, for sine and cos, and nobody wrote the function for tan. Okay. So you could write that function for tan. This is of course not true. But obviously all these common functions are all taken care of. So suppose somebody didn't write that, you could write that particular function and incorporate it into your version of NumPy. If it is actually good, then the NumPy people may actually pick it up and use it. But in any case, you have the source code for everything. You can use it like your own NumPy extension. So NumPy provided you with 400 functions and you added a few more functions to that. <coughs> the second option, now I'm going to first discuss how you're going to extend C and then I will come, or C++, and then I will come to how we are going to extend Fortran. Okay. So first let's take uh, C, and with C the most commonly used uh, method uh, for extending uh, Python is via a software development tool known as Swig. And the purpose of Swig is to connect programs written in C or C++ with many other languages and Python is just one of them and here you can see that it can be used to connect uh, C with Perl, C with PHP, C with PCL, C with Python, C with Ruby, C with C Sharp and so on. Almost all the major languages that are uh, in uh, use today have uh, can be extended via Swing. Okay. Uh, this is where it's most commonly used uh, for to create high-level interpreted or compiled programming environments, user interfaces, and as a tool for testing and prototyping C++ C++ software. So it turns out, maybe I have that uh, on the next slide. No. Uh, it turns out that uh, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is one of the major optical telescope facilities that's coming up, are going to use SWIG and Python. So what they are going to do is, they are going to control everything by writing all the time critical codes which have to run very fast. They will rewrite those in C++ and they will call them from within Python. Okay. So the main user interface will be Python, but the underlying uh, high speed computations or data processing will be done using C++ code. Okay. So now let us look at an example okay so this is a, a simple C program those of you who are C programmers will not find it difficult to understand uh, it includes a standard uh, header time.h Okay, then it declares one variable to be double and initialize it, it to three. Then there are three functions over here. The first function computes the factorial of an integer. Okay, this is a trivial thing. And the second function actually called computes the remainder, the modulo division function, which already exists in Python, but just as an illustration, we are writing our own function called myMod, which takes two integers as input, x and y and it uh, divides x by y and returns the remainder, okay? And the third one is slightly more com uh, complicated. There are uh, pointers and addresses and so on. But this is just a standard function to get the time, the system time from within a C program, okay? So this one, this function returns for you something called C time, which is the clock time, which is basically the date and the time. Of, of this particular laptop in my case. Okay, so this is just to illustrate that there are three different things. One is sort of Unix or Linux level programming. 
this is trivial integer calculation this is also another integer calculation i have only three functions in this example.c program but there could be 300 it doesn't matter okay so these are the c functions that we want to wrap these are the ones we want to access from within python in order to add uh, these files uh, to your favorite language, in our case Python, one needs to write what is called an interface file, which is an input to switch. Okay, an interface file listing all the C functions we want to wrap is needed. So I'll give you, I'll show you what my interface file looks like. It's called example.i. So those of you who have written header files in C will find this again quite familiar, except that there is a peculiar syntax. There is this percentage brace and brace percentage sign and there are these things uh, in between, okay? And uh, this thing, so these are special commands, okay, percentage. This is, this is not true, this is not C code, okay? This is some format which only Swig understands. It's a configuration file in which you are basically declaring and uh, in some sense twice you are declaring <coughs> all the variables and all the functions that you have in your code, in your C code. Okay? So this is called, uh, this would typically go into a header file where you have all your uh, function declarations. So this is just like a function declaration file uh, which you commonly write in C. So it basically tells you that this is an external variable, the type is double, it's called my variable. So, similarly, it gives you for factorial, it tells you that it takes an integer input and it returns an integer and it's an external variable and so on. So, these are very easy to write. So, if you had now 300 functions that you wanted to wrap, you would have 300 lines of code over here. Okay. Or 300 plus 300, uh, 600 lines of code over here. Now, once you have that, And so this is the example dot. Uh, then we need to build the module, okay? And this is done in three steps. In the first step, we take the example dot i file which I just showed you as the input, and I give the command swig minus python example dot i. Minus python tells swig is that you create an interface between C C plus plus and Python. If I wanted to interface to PHP or Perl, I would change this keyword over here. Okay? Swig is a part of Linux only. No, you have to install it separately. It's a separate package which you have to download and install. Okay. Then I have this GCC compiler. Uh, these are just some compiler options over here. Minus C example.c is the C program that I want to compile in. Exam, what is this example wrap.c? This is actually uh, some wrapping code that has been generated in this step. So I have not written it, but it has been auto-generated by this command. The output of this command is a, 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 a file called example wrap.c. And then I have to give it the include directories where all the header <coughs> files, etc. from the Python side uh, that it needs are included. This compiles the code and it generates, you remember that gcc minus c will create for you an object file, a .o file, okay? Now you need to use the linker in order to link uh, example.o which got created, example wrap.o got created and you link in them into a, into a shared library and I give this minus o where as an location of the file where I want to place that output shared line. Okay. So normal compilation is compilation and linking happens together, but you can do it in two steps. You can compile to object code and then use the linker to link your object codes together to form your execute. So this is like an executable except that it is being made into a dot so or a shared object line. Okay, this, this is all standard C stuff, but let us just go through that exercise. I have to save time, I have already typed these things in, okay? So this is my first <coughs> SWIG code. 
this I told you has created a output file called example wrap dot c. Okay, so at the top it tells you this file was automatically generated by Swig. Okay, and it warns you that this file is not intended to be easily readable, and it contains a lot of coding conventions which are uh, designed to improve portability and efficient efficiency. Don't make any changes to this file. Okay, don't try to modify this file. Uh, you will also be get a little scared uh, to modify the file if you look at the contents of the file. Not only is it quite unreadable and complex, it is also very large. Okay, and I'll uh, show you how large in terms of number of lines. But you can see it's got all kinds of swig directives and this and that. Okay, so it has generated 3954 lines of code. Okay. Remember our example.c was about 20 lines, I think 20 lines. And example.i was similar, but it's generated lots of but you don't have to worry about it. Let it generate it whatever it wants. Then we have to run GCC. So that's what it does. It takes all the .o files and it compiles it. Since it didn't give any error, that means it's through. And then we run the linker. So what has it created for us as the final output is this particular file, example.so, which is the shared object value. Now what you can do is, once you have this shared object, object library, you can go to the IPython terminal and I am in the same directory as previously here and I can do something like import example. Okay, Since my module is called example, I have to import it as example. So when <coughs> I type import example, uh, it goes looking for, sorry, it also creates something called example.py. Which is a trivial thing with uh, code, you can look at that code also. Okay, this was also automatically generated by Swing. You don't have to do anything. But what it basically does is that it gives for you it's a Python program which you has all kinds of Swig directives, but it also has things that you will recognize are your fact, my mod, and get time codes that you had originally written in C, which are now looking like Python functions. Since they look like Python functions, they can also be called as Python functions. So I can do example dot <coughs> factorial, okay, and it gives you the answer. Okay. Now what is happening here? The code is being is a Fortran executable. Sorry, it's a C executable. It is not a Python executable. So when I did this thing, it actually called an underlying C function, which did the calculation and returned the value back to me. Notice here that I, there is no error checking at all. Okay? <coughs> I have not done any error uh, input uh, checking, input type checks or uh, value checks in the C program. Python has not done anything on its own. So if I give it some, let's say, ridiculous value, it gives me wrong answers. Okay, it basically has resulted uh, in some kind of overflow in the in the C program, and it has returned some junk. In this case, zero. Okay, it could also return nan or whatever. Okay? So it is your responsibility to actually either do a check in the Python code or you do a check in the C code. What you, what no, even even if you do recursion less than 100, and less than 500 gives you. So it, it's a, no, this is a very large number. Factorial of 100 is a very, very large number. You need to handle it uh, specially. We haven't done, uh, taken any such care. Are you using 64 bit integer? It is uh, in the C, it's using double 64 bit uh, integer. 
and even that it can't handle for 100 factor okay now you can call the other programs okay uh, example dot my mod for example 3 comma 2 so the remainder of this calculation is 1 so it should print 1 which it does if i do 3 comma 3 it does that. now i can do example dot uh, get time this doesn't take any arguments <coughs> and it just prints out the time if i run that function uh, again i get a slightly different time so it's picking up the real clock time and printing it out okay so what have we done here we have actually connected python to to c by using sway Okay, so what has happened now is that we have said that uh, 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 Python is strongly typed but dynamically typed. Okay, but C or Fortran or C++ are strongly typed and statically typed. Once you declare a variable to be an integer in C, you can't next line use it as if it were a string. It causes, it's, it, once it's declared as an integer, compiler knows this variable is an integer, it, that's the end of the line. You can't. Uh, so, what you should, you, so this can cause lots of errors. Okay. So, for example, you could pass a string, for example. So, Python will happily pass it on to, uh, to the C code. And then the C code will encounter a string as input. And then it will uh, either give a jump value or crash or give you an error. So ideally, you should use something called asserts. These are there in C. How many of you have used uh, those who are C programmers have used uh, the assert statement? C++, C++ also. Have you used it? Okay. Assert basically says that it uh, it has a simple syntax. The idea is that you say assert some condition to be true. If it is not true, you can give what it should do. By default, it just stops. Okay. So for example, if uh, you are supplying some variable to a function and that variable has to be an integer let's say and let's say that variable is called a you can say assert type of a is n dot in in if that is not true the program will stop you can also tell it to do something else print a message or whatever <coughs> but that program will stop that ensures automatically that nothing bad will happen if you give incorrect input so always you should intersperse your code with lots of assert statements and this is not just true for python it's true for any language you should have lots of assert statements continuously asserting that something is uh, so for example you do a lot of data processing some number one number becomes negative and because of that your program crashes you try to take try to take square root or something and it crashes you should assert before trying to take the square root that the number whose square root you are taking is a positive number, but greater than or equal to 0. You can assert that number is greater than or equal to 0. If not, then you do the square root. Otherwise, and you can put any kind of complicated expression in the assert. You can assert that call some function and determine that uh, the determinant is of, of this matrix is of a certain value. Okay. Uh, anything can be done. So you can assert any function, its output value uh, is equal to some value. If not, if that expression evaluates to false, the program stops. Oh. Uh, Swift is extremely, extremely powerful. So, uh, some of the older people here would have encountered a program called SM, uh, which is used for plotting. Uh, SM was written by an astronomer, his name is Robert Lupton at Princeton. He was my boss while I was there. Uh, he wrote SM when he was a student and postdoc, <coughs> but when Python came along, he wanted to access SM from within Python. So he decided to use Swig to wrap all the functions of SM. Okay, uh, and he managed to wrap the entire SM program, which is about twenty thousand lines of code with many many functions, in a few days with Swig. Okay. Uh, the few days has to be taken with a piece of salt because uh, uh, Robert Lupton uh, is uh, an expert programmer in C 
and also an expert programmer in Python and uh, many other things. So it may take some other people a few weeks, okay? But uh, still, it's, it's doable. You can wrap extremely complex codes in C using Swing. Okay. So before we leave wrapping with C, I'm going to just speak briefly uh, on something which is a new and upcoming idea, which is a SciPy module called Weave. Okay. The idea behind Weave is that there are basically three ways of uh, using Weave. The simplest is something called Weave.inline. Yes. So the wrapping activity is very custom because the program Python script which is calling these outside things has to be delayed. Yes. It's not yeah. that like SM you are saying it's a very common thing. Yeah. It can't be made into a library for Python. You have to actually wrap it with the thing code which is calling SM. See, so you have to make somehow SM is a C program. Right. Python is a Python language. Right. You have to do something so that you can call uh, a C program from within Python in a seamless way, which means you can exchange data between them, like we just did. We passed some value, <laughs> it's a factorial of 10. That 10 was given to Python, but it eventually reached C. No, no, C I have to that, that, but can't, can't it be done for a standard library? The whole set of subroutines seem to. Ha, no, no, that is exactly what he did. So now that uh, Robert Lupton has wrapped SM. Okay. Anybody can, we don't have to repeat okay. that. So that it's been done only once. I thought it okay. should be done again. No, 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 it doesn't have to be done again. But there might be something else which is uh, not wrapped. Okay. He has wrapped it. So from within, if you want to use SM from within Python, you just need your SM license to be installed, etc. And you can use it. There is nothing more. I mean, he provides you the whatever uh, wrapping code uh, is necessary, he gives it to you. So you might just have to put one more step in the compilation or something. Nothing more. You can use uh, the output of his work uh, free. Okay. So I'm just going to mention a bit about this uh, weave dot inline function, which basically allows you to basically write C code directly within Python. And I'll show you one example. <coughs> then there is something called weave dot blitz. What it does is that you give it a NumPy expression that you think is running very slow. Give it the full expression. Okay, you are uh, let's say trying to invert a matrix in one line. Inverse of a matrix. That part is very slow. Okay, you can supply that to C++ for fast execution. So Blitz is a very interesting uh, function by which you can take existing NumPy uh, uh, functions and these get translated to C, C, uh, sorry, C++ directly. Okay. There are, in some cases, advantages. See, actually, NumPy itself is written in C. So when you give NumPy expression, it's going to run at C-like speeds. But this actually translates it into C++, does some complex optimization, so it will run somewhat faster. Okay. <coughs> this. Uh, for those interested in building extension libraries, they have given a new module called EXP Tools for building your own extension modules from within Python. Uh, it's very easy to use. Here's a trivial example. Uh, you say import sci-fi.weave as weave, set some variable equal to work, weave.inline, and then I start my C code. Print f, uh, bracket, percentage d, this should be backslash n. So in my tech, it got uh, incorrectly typed because it just put a new line there. Backslash n, code closed, comma a, semicolon, and close this single code. So from here to here is my single line, in line, C code. Now you say, what if my C code is 10 lines long? What you do is you simply make, use that triple code syntax, which Kaustuk talked about, that allows you to do multi-line strings. Use that to write up thousand line string if you want, your entire uh, C here, code. <coughs> and then put it in your Python code, say code equal to something. And here, instead of giving a string, you give the value code. Okay. And that's a, just a string variable. And then you give it the variable that Python variable that you want to use as this A. Okay. 
So I don't have time to go into details of this, but this is some new idea that has been coming up and it's becoming increasingly popular. So you may, you should monitor it, okay? And if SWIG doesn't meet your requirement, then explore if Weave gives you the kind of uh, functionality you need. Now we'll move to Fortran. Fortran, it turns out, is easier. You don't even have to write that interface file or anything like that. <coughs> you use something called F2Pi. Just like we use SWIG for C, we use F2Pi for the Fortran to Python interface generator. It auto-generates interface files to allow Python to call a Fortran subroutine. Uh, installing F2Pi is very easy or uh, doesn't need to be done, which is best. Uh, recent versions of NumPy already include F2Pi. Okay, so F2Pi is now part of NumPy. So if you install NumPy, then it's nothing more to do. That's it. Over. So now let us take a trivial uh, hello world kind of example. Um, so this is a standard uh, Fortran program. It's got one sub subroutine, it's called foo, which takes one argument a, okay, that happens to be, a, to be an integer, it prints hello from Fortran, and then it prints a equal to comma a. So it prints out the value of a, and it ends. So single subroutine. But like before, like with uh, SWIG, this is just an example. I have only one subroutine here. But if you had 100 subroutines in this file, all 100 will get wrapped at the uh, at one go. Okay. So now let's look at what we need to do. Okay. So in order to build the module, what you do is issue this command, f2pi minus c minus m. Minus m indicates it's a uh, command line keyword for uh, f2pi indicates that you want the module to be called hello okay the module that you're generating and this is the name of the fortran file that you will use so So it does something, it gives me some warning about some deprecated uh, NumPy API and so on. And uh, it links with G4 Tran, etc, etc. And uh, in the end, it removes that temporary build directory. And then what it has created for me is a single file, which is called hello.so which is again now a shared object file, but which is created from a Fortran source. Okay. okay, so before let's look at the output. So since hello dot <coughs> so has been created, I do import hello. Now notice that there is no hello.py file in like we had example.py, there's no hello.py because hello.so also exists. So Python is designed so that it looks for a .py file. If it can't find a .py file, if it looks for a shared object file or uh, in which it can import. No, I'm doing it in the wrong place. It will do it from within Python. Okay, now it has imported the hello module. Now if I do hello dot, I can do something interesting where I can type help hello okay. and it creates some help automatically. I didn't give even one line of uh, comments or anything and then it told me that okay this module hello is auto generated with f2pi and it has one function f2. Okay, if I had 100 functions there, they would all be listed there. right? I can, there are directives by which you can increase this documentation. So you can put specific comments in your Fortran code so that this documentation becomes more helpful. Okay. But we, we haven't put anything. So it, it just generates some basic documentation. Now I do hello.tab. 
it gives me that hello dot foo and uh, I was expected to give it an integer and it should say hello from Fortran and print the value of that integer which it has propagated. So what has happened here? We have taken a value 3 from, Fortran, uh, from Python. It has gone to that Fortran code. It has done something with it and it has sent me return to me and value. Okay. So these were of course a very trivial example. So now we are going to look at a slightly more complicated uh, Fortran code, which is a code to calculate the first n Fibonacci uh, numbers. Okay, Fibonacci numbers are basically start with 1, 1, and 1, 1, 1 plus 1, and so on. Uh, go on generating numbers. So, in order to, so I have a code here. Yeah. So, this is uh, it has got subroutine fib. Yeah. Uh, it takes a and n. Okay. Uh, where <coughs> a n is the function okay. and n is the integer. Yeah. And then it basically this is the the logic which computes the Fibonacci sequence. Okay. Notice here that we are giving some very specific comments uh, which tell uh, help f2pi understand which are the input variables and which are the output variables here. Remember n is something which is going to come in from outside into this subroutine. So therefore you say intent in bracket in n. So n is a if you attempt to modify n inside this subroutine it will give you will get an error okay by, by compilation itself saying that look n is an input variable you can't change it what you can change is anything that is intent out okay a and you can also put what are called depend dependencies you basically a of course depends on n a is a function of n right so a which is your Fibonacci sequence depends on the value of n. So we have put in 3. So to the Fortran program, since this starts with C, this appears as a comment. But for the F2Pi compiler, C F2Pi indicates that these are some lines that F2Pi should read and understand and interpret in its own way. Okay, we'll come to the various other commands that you can specify here. You can also have in out variables. Some variables come in okay and they also get modified and then they go out so they are both input and output variables <coughs> and that is allowed okay so now in order to compile uh, the code it's the same dance it's uh, this one when we say f2 pi minus c minus m this is the name of the module you want fib 3 dot f okay i press enter and it does all kinds of things and uh, it builds for me what will it create what file should it have created a dot so file which will be fib3 dot so which is right here okay so that is done now i can go back to python and i can type import fib 3. Now let us try to do help of a fib 3. Okay. So again it tells me that there is only one function here. A is equal to fib of n. Okay. <coughs> it is a subroutine. It is not a uh, function. Okay. So now we can do fib 3 dot fib and let us say the first 10 numbers in the Fibonacci sequence and there it gives me an output. Notice here it says array here that means this is a numpy array. Since now f2pi is an extension library in some sense of numpy it has automatically does not give you a list back then automatically converted that into an appropriate 
tight ng pyre. This also is uh, problematic although Fibonacci sequences don't grow that fast. But if you went to very large numbers, there would be problems. Okay. Now, there could also be rounding problems. See, this, this thing is returning, uh, if you look at the type of this object, what do you think it is? What is it, the type going to be? What is it? What is it? What type of object is this? Yellow. I'm not asking about the type of, I'm asking about the type of the whole object, not individual values. Yeah. It's a numpy dot ndi. Okay. So now you can also do, uh, you can do things like, So I have given it the third element. So index 2 of this array, I have asked for the type of that array and it has printed it out as floats. Okay. So it has converted the output into floats. What did we give it in uh, fib 3.f? Uh, what is That's right. We are returning an integer. Okay. So, therefore, it converted that into a real star 8 means a 64-bit uh, integer. Okay. And that is why float 64, sorry, 64-bit real. So, therefore, float 64 is the data type of this object. Okay. This, of course, is going to lead to errors because the Fibonacci sequence as, as I have given it, Okay. Or since we start with uh, 1 and 1 or 0 and 1, uh, it is going to be only integers, but it is returning floats. So beyond the point, it is not really going to be accurate when it goes up to this point. Okay. Now 10 raised to 60, so it will still be okay. And then won't be a problem. Okay. So now going back to our presentation. Sometimes you can't edit the Fortran code okay? because partly maybe you have the compiled code and uh, it's been working for a long time. You have lost the source code somewhere, okay? <coughs> or for some copyright reasons, etc. You are not allowed to modify the Fortran code. Then, just like you wrote signature files this way, you have to write signature files with uh, with F2 pi, and there the idea is again very similar. What did we do? We basically declared what are the type of input variables and output variables. Okay. Similar thing, it has its own syntax. The syntax will not be exactly the same as the switch syntax. But the idea is you declare all your functions and you declare all your variables. Uh, you can go through the F2Py documentation uh, to uh, identify what, what the signature file is. Okay. So F2Py automatically generates the documentation is underscore underscore doc as it is called and it can even optionally generate latex documentation. So you have a large number of subroutines, so you can comment them very nicely and then use F2Py to automatically generate latex documentation for your subroutines. Uh, this is really very useful. Uh, F2Py generated functions accept arbitrary but sensible Python options as arguments. Okay, and the F2Py interface automatically takes care of typecast. We saw one example of that. Since that Fortran variable was a 64-bit float, it, the Python array that it created was a 64-bit float array. We didn't have to worry about explicit typecast. Most of the Fortran 90 features also work. Uh, F2Py is really a boon because uh, there is a friend of mine, uh, now a professor at Yale. For many years, he has been doing something like this. He writes all his program in, in Python. Uh, then he says, oh, this, this part is very slow. He profiles it and finds that okay, some part is slow. So he quickly writes a Fortran subroutine, which does exactly what that Python thing does. And he puts 
uses f2 pi makes a module puts it in puts it in so he really has uh, using f2 pi and a simple module uh, for every python program that he writes he have a corresponding f2 pi code when all the slow parts of that python will be speeded up with uh, equivalent for that code and he says that for him at least and i, I believe him uh, it's very efficient since he was a very good fortran programmer already doing this is the fastest way of uh, for him to get very fast code and literally uh, uh, he was working for a long time with the sloan digital sky survey uh, and at that time he wrote he was a very very efficient and prodigious programmer and one reason for that was this he would quickly prototype something in python in one day then he would find out the parts that are slow so he would give you a working but slow version in one day <coughs> then one month later or a few weeks later he will give you a working and fast version okay. uh, so really it's it's very very efficient particularly if you have expertise in fortran programming okay, and you don't want to lose it then working in this model is very viable uh, there is something called pi fort which i have not spoken about but that was a sort of alternative to f2 pi uh with its own uh, strengths and weaknesses but i think it has not been in active development for some time so 2 3 years ago f2 pi and uh, pi fort were neck to neck competitors now f2 pi is way ahead it is sort of the default way of doing things we mentioned that in that c f2 pi statements you can <laughs> specify the intent of any particular object okay you can specify even things like dimensions whether something is common and so on okay and uh, you can even put note and say see latex text okay you can put latex statements uh, inside there okay you can make it thread safe you can uh, uh, specify the uh, fortran version you want to use and so on okay so it, uh, these are uh, You can specify which variables are external, which variables have to be specified in for the program to work, which are optional, which are required, and so on. So it's it's all quite flexible, and the documentation is excellent. You just Google F two Pi, you will get the right page. The documentation. Okay. So now I'll just briefly mention. This is not really relevant for most of you, so we'll just uh, very quickly cover it. Uh, for uh, extending uh, an option to c there is something called uh, sip okay and it only works with c++ and uh, and python okay then there is something called c types no interface code is needed unlike swing and can direct directly call compiled functions in a binary library file and some features work only on windows so if you don't use windows this is not very useful <coughs> some years ago there was a module called boost.python uh which was good for wrapping entire libraries in uh, c or c++ and uh, as i mentioned uh, lssc is using uh, uh, swing and python but they are also using boost.python uh, in a significant way then there was something called pyrex it's a python like language designed for writing python extension modules i have not uh, personally used uh, this thing but Uh, that too has actually fallen into disuse is my uh, experience pyrex is no longer being talked about however the last one scipy.weave is uh, some new thing as i mentioned and that needs to be kept a watch out uh you can even extend python to java and c sharp okay for java the basically the only game in town is something called jaithan okay it's an implementation of python for the java virtual machine okay so what that means is it's python language written in java so you know that the python interpreter is a, is written in c right but if you take the whole write rewrite the python interpreter this time in java then you have <coughs> when you type python you don't call a c program you call a java program and this of course makes it easy to use any kind of java library okay. and this is the approach taken by jaithan and this allows seamless integration with the use of java libraries and other java based applications but then c python extensions don't work that's a big disadvantage so for example numpy which you want to use all the time is written in c python 
that won't work if you use Java. But if you are completely married to Java, then uh, this is really the only option. Similarly, if you use C Sharp, which is Microsoft's competitor to Java, uh, there is something called Iron Python, okay, which is now an implementation of the Python programming language under .NET and Silver Silverlight. These are the underlying Microsoft technologies. So this is now Python written with .NET and Silverlight. So that obviously gives you very excellent integration with uh, C Sharp based libraries. So, to summarize, here are my recommendations. So, first, see if NumPy C extensions will do the job for you. Even before this, of course, see whether you actually need to do any of these things. If you are just happily programming in Python, then forget about it. Okay? If you use Fortran, any flavor, then definitely use F2Py. Okay? If you need to write fresh code for speedy execution, do this approach that Nikhil Padmanabhan does. Uh, which is right in Fortran and wrapped with F2 part. Uh, for C, C++, uh, use SWIG or maybe SIP. Okay. But I think SWIG is now a sort of the preferred choice. For Java, you have to use Jython. For C Sharp, you have to use Python. There's no option. For all other languages, SWIG is the default option. Okay. And uh, last thing in bold, Please don't forget regression tests because in Python it's very hard to write buggy programs. But once you start extending Python and calling C and Fortran and C++, etc., then you can easily do things that will crash your thing, give you a core dump, etc. All those kind of errors uh, will start coming. Okay? So you must do a lot of tests to ensure that the new code that you have written will not cause any kind of problems. If any problems are likely to happen, you should catch them in Python. It is likely to happen when you send incorrect inputs uh, to that function. Make sure your inputs are correct. Use assert search statements liberally. And then you should not have a problem. Okay, happy wrapping. Uh, now we've formally come to the close of this lecture, but there is one more lecture remaining. And as we said last time, we are going to have uh, discussion session on the assignments. Uh, those of you who have looked at the web page would have seen that now there is a second assignment which has been put there. It is more advanced than the first assignment. It will require more effort on your part. But remember that all these assignments we have given you, the answers have to be very short. Okay? If your code is turning out to be 50 lines long, then you are doing something completely unpythonic or completely wrong. All the answers to all the problems we have given in the assignments should be programs which are between 5 and 10 lines long. Okay? If you are doing it longer than that, then you are not using something that uh, yeah, you have been taught in class. You have forgotten some simple concept and you are doing it the wrong way. Okay? Uh, so, uh, so on Wednesday, we will have about half an hour session to discuss some of the assignment problems. So you have to come and ask us that, okay, we tried this and uh, it doesn't work, what should we do? Uh, there is, in fact, unfortunately, uh, a talk at 4 o'clock on Wednesday in Ayuka. Uh, if Ankar is giving some talk, so I would like to go. Is it 5.30 or 4 o'clock? I think it's 4 o'clock. Uh, so let's see. So we will finish in time and then we will leave at 5 to 4. Okay, so we'll see you on Wednesday for the last lecture of this course.